cancer and pregnancy, it's a, an area that we, I suppose, opened up really a conversation about 10 years ago when the charity began um, back in 2013, um, because there wasn't previously an organisation out there that uh, was specifically set up to support families in the situation of either where a mother or birthing parent has a diagnosis of any type of cancer at any point during pregnancy, and that includes those families where they sadly might incur the loss of a pregnancy, either because of um, a direct impact of the cancer diagnosis that they receive or subsequent treatment that they may have to have, or through loss um, for other causes, whether it was suddenly miscarriage, stillbirth, or and you know some other form of birth-related complication for that baby, um, and that also that support extends also to families where they receive that diagnosis up to and including twelve months postnatally as well, and likewise that also has the same framing if if loss is incurred, and we also provide our families because our our support at Mummy Star is very much a full life cycle of support, and when I say that, it's not about necessarily from from birth to death it's about a, a life cycle in terms of how families how long families want to stay in touch with us we don't have a cutoff um but sadly the reality of working with you know people and supporting people with cancer is that some of those in families sadly will succumb to that cancer so we do provide that ongoing support to families as well where they sadly do um die as a result of a cancer diagnosis having been received in one of those two um time frames earlier and that's where it's ongoing um provision of support to the surviving partner if they've been in touch with us as well. Um, we initially were an organisation that covered the UK and um, the UK and Scotland, and then we've expanded to cover um, Ireland as well. So we have this full geographical coverage, um, but obviously we're able to focus that in terms of our resources on different um, the different countries within that, that geography that we cover as well. Um, and so we're obviously coming up to, with us being in June 2023 now, we're, we've come up to this, this huge milestone that seems to, it felt like it's crept up rather than you know, feeling like it's been coming for quite some time. And we've, you know, we've we've been a decade in operation. Um, but the reality for somebody receiving a cancer diagnosis and what we've been talking about for that time is trying to unpick, you know, what it feels like for somebody, you know, how isolating it is when somebody receives that diagnosis, whether somebody is in a first pregnancy, whether they've had, you know, whether it's the, their fourth pregnancy, whether they've experienced loss of pregnancy or not, you know, previously, or they've struggled perhaps for many years to conceive in the first place. And then to hear somebody inform you, you know, whether whatever type of symptoms you, you've had or whatever has led up to that diagnosis, to hear the words cancer in and around pregnancy, it creates this trauma, but on a multitude of levels. So there is, as there would be for anybody receiving a cancer diagnosis, that immediate concern of, you know, fear of life and, you know, your, you know, what does this mean for you? What is it going to feel like? What does, what does treatment going to look like? If indeed there are options, depending on your situation. But when a cancer diagnosis comes in and around pregnancy, there obviously is this double this double layer to it, which is what does that then mean for your you know for your baby? Does it is there the are the options that are going to be laid out in front of you going to be, um, you know, is it going to be okay to proceed with that while you're still pregnant? What is it going to mean from your for your postnatal experience and and your maternity experience as people expect to whether like I said it's a first pregnancy or a subsequent pregnancy, people's expectations of maternity is is are quite fixed even though the you know the reality unfolds for each each person in their in their own journey. But all of a sudden, maternity experience is punctuated by appointments and surgeries and chemotherapy and treatments and and all these different stages and milestones that people go through and the the building towards subsequent scans and waiting for results and this 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 fear that you know that people are are kind of living with on an ongoing basis and living their their lives in in kind of short three to four month chunks. Um, so that that whole experience of maternity, both in pregnancy and postnatally, is is totally upended in this kind of scenario, and it it results in this total loss of control for families. They don't know what their choices are anymore in pregnancy. They certainly feel this huge sense of isolation that they will be, by far and away, the youngest person that will probably be having chemotherapy within that ward in that hospital. They'll certainly be the only person who is either cradling a newborn baby or you know has a growing bump as they're going through treatment, and. There was this real, um, a real gap in provision as to what it felt like, not just to have cancer, but also be trying to juggle pregnancy or, or, or you know, in or in a postnatal period as well. So, by you know, when when Mummy Star started, this was one of our original aims was to try and combat that and try and reduce that sense of isolation for families immediately by helping them feel seen and feeling heard and and that sense of validation that comes with it. But it doesn't, you know, sadly, it doesn't end there. There are, you know, there's the other, I suppose, the 
the things that we take for granted in pregnancy, you know, for, as as you know, as parent coming at this from any any side, is the loss of you know feeding choices. Can I breastfeed? Do I am I going to have to bottle feed? That bonding that's suddenly interrupted as a, resu as a result of those things being removed for families, and it's not only there in the immediate point of diagnosis as well. It comes in a, in a form of what we refer to as grieving whilst living quite a lot when we're supporting families. It's this it's this loss of of sense of self, of sense of normal, of expectation of what your life would look like, what your maternity experience would look like, what your ability to parent in the way that you had perhaps hoped to or the way you had parented previously with other children had had unfolded. And all of a sudden there may be mobility issues around that. There may be side effects that come with that around, you know, subsequent treatment. Menopause is a huge you know, issue for many of our families around being, you know, pushed into early menopause in your 20s, 30s or 40s as a result of, um, you know, ongoing treatment and the longer term side effects. And also for many of our families, the reality sadly is that that cancer, by the time it is found or because there is, you know, subsequent, um, you know, growth of that cancer, it can mean living with cancer on an ongoing basis and never seeing an end of of, of treatment as, as you know, as, as many of the, the wider population expect to see that there will be a start and a finish to treatment. We you know, we, the reality is that many people do live with cancer and the and the unknowns that that, you know, the, the further unknowns that that brings to families, the anxieties. And then there's the, the build towards, you know, what does that mean? How long, how many of those key milestones are you going to then subsequently see in a child's life? Or are you going to be here for those first birthdays, those first birthdays at school, those first, but even on the shorter term, it's those those first roles, those first little giggles and, you know, and all those those baby moments that many of us as parents, as grandparents, you know, as, as siblings, we all look forward to. We, when we take it for granted as this, as what pregnancy and postnatally, what it looks like for, you know, for many families. So this, and you know, even in between all of these things that I've just talked about, there's so there's so many idiosyncrasies in there that further, you know, further um, impact those families in terms of their own personal experience and the structure that they have around them. Now, in terms of cancer and pregnancy, it wasn't an area that was, you know, very well discussed. It didn't come up in conversation. The cases were very few and far between. And when we, we um, we requested Public Health England to do some work for us a few years ago to try and get a real fix on exactly how common this was coming up. Um, and that research looked at hospital admissions to date data where, where it coincided with maternity and cancer. And it showed that the, the approximation is around one in a thousand um, cases of cancer will be, sorry, one, one in a thousand cases will be diagnosed in pregnancy or postnatally. But when you break that down, when looking at the birth rates across the across England and Wales over the last five to six years, that equates in reality to two people a day being diagnosed. But where we go from initially feeling like this is a rare scenario and that it doesn't come up that often all of a sudden when you put two a day onto it it suddenly feels real it feels like it could be your next patient it could feels like it could be that next family that come into the ward or you know somebody that's close to you within your own you know within your own networks or a work colleague or a family member um so the reality is that this this does happen and in future years and with birth trends that we do see in the uk it's only going to get more common because people are going to fall or as, as people leave it into the into their later 30s, early 40s to start start a family for the first time, not through causation, but they will fall into higher risk brackets in terms of age. And that resulting, we'll see that we'll probably see more cases being diagnosed um, rather than less. So where once upon a time it may have been a situation as a health professional where it was a case of if you'll ever see a case in your career, now it's more a case of as and when you will see and how many you will see over your career as well. So being prepared, having the awareness, having the, the understanding of what you know, this entails for families is has become absolutely essential. Um, the the kind of issues and, and the way we see diagnosis unfold with you know with the, the families that we've supported at Mummy Star, we see an equal split with families being diagnosed, you know, in pregnancy and postnatally. But when we actually strip those figures down and, and delve a little bit deeper, the issue we have with cancer and pregnancy and diagnosis is the fact that many of the families that were diagnosed after pregnant after birth had actually been pre presenting with their symptoms, you know, differing symptoms depending on the type of cancer that they were diagnosed with. But they were actually presenting with their symptoms many times through pregnancy. They may have had multiple presentations at different health services or different junctions within their pregnancy. But there is a culture of dismissal that exists in a much wider scale around women's health full stop. But in a, in a cancer setting, there just is this lack of routine consideration that cancer cancer a can happen during pregnancy or postnatally and b that the symptoms when they do present are are passed up passed off quite often as a sign of of 
body, you know, body related change during pregnancy, breath change and growth, density, abdominal discomfort, um, you know, cervical symptoms, um, you know, bleeding, er erosion, um, breathlessness. There's there's so many reasons why these symptoms are, are seen in pregnancy as part of pregnancy. But yet, if we were to look at these same symptoms in somebody who was not pregnant, they would probably be elevated very quickly and seen as the red flags that they should be taken. So we're trying to our our work is very much one of trying to instill a culture of considering could it be cancer and if if so what are the processes that you then can follow as a health professional to be able to make sure that you can offer that reassurance to families as early as possible and if sadly a cancer is subsequently getting diagnosed then it the earlier that that process takes place the wider the net of options is for those families rather than it being a multiply delayed diagnosis and then by the time it comes around that that's that range of options has shrunk quite significantly or in the worst case that cancer by sadly by that stage is actually subsequently spread um to another part of the body so it's about early awareness, early um, you know, early intervention, and the key thing is listening and encouraging advocacy, both from from health professionals, but also for you know for the person themselves who is experiencing the, the symptoms to be you know to be their own advocate and to know that they have a right to to challenge opinion constructively and to be able to push for further investigation. The other big myth in and around this this area is that you know that there are many choices in pregnancy far more than people do expect um part of the the, the reason why that there seems to be this this feeling of of, of the, a lack of options and a lack of choice for families is because the idea and as, and this maybe stems from people's own experiences of, of having chemotherapy or seeing relatives or friends go through treatment is that this idea that when you see people have suffer all the side effects that come with many treatments I suppose that the, you 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 start to consider how could that possibly be conducive with an ongoing pregnancy? How could that not be impactful to the you know to the ongoing um, you know growth of a baby and and the ongoing health of that child as they develop in the womb as well? But the reality is very very different. There are many choices in pregnancy. For, you know, families are able to birth you know quite quite commonly in the way that they would like, whether it's a home birth, whether it's water birth, whether it's um, you know sort of any other form. It's, it's the the simple diagnosis of cancer in pregnancy does not rule out choice, but because of this lack of experience out there amongst professionals in in supporting people in this situation. And because of a lack of information and therefore that cross working and sharing of of um, experience of supporting and treating people in pregnancy, it therefore creates this narrowing of, of, of the options for families. And one of our you know key roles in the last 10 years has been expanding that, sharing those examples of families where they have birthed the way they, they've chosen to and ensuring that families ultimately have informed choice throughout their pregnancy, but equally postnatally as well in terms of how they're supported. And what comes in tandem with that is that those families where sadly, you know, the, the the loss of a pregnancy becomes a real time consideration around whether the cancer, as I touched upon earlier on, is a is a real time impact and the family have to consider ending a pregnancy early. It isn't the only option that families have to consider, whereas with this is something that we have come across many, many times where through a lack of experience, people have maybe been ill advised that they may want to have they may want to consider ending a pregnancy early when in fact potentially delaying treatment to begin for maybe two or three more weeks until they're in the second trimester of that pregnancy then provides them with far more options and there may actually be a way for them to continue continue that pregnancy um you know to to full term and, and delivery but the key thing is just making families aware and placing options in the hands of families so that ultimately it is down for them to decide whether they forgo treatment and proceed with the pregnancy, whether they have treatment and they continue through or whether they choose, you know, through a balance of, of different options that actually ending that pregnancy early for them is is the is the option that they feel they have to go down um, because of, you know, what that cancer is, is potentially going to do. Um, so choice and informed choice is is the is the cornerstone really of, of you know of what we what we want to see in our families and 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 them being involved in how their their plan is is developed for them. Um, so at this point, I'm going to pass over to Ria Crichton, who has um, been uh, um, involved for a number of years now, but has you know kindly sort of agreed to to talk through her own experiences. So Ria, I'm just going to take the slides down so that we can actually see you, if that's okay, and then I'll yep. hand over to you. Hi. Um... So my name's Ria, I am uh, a health professional, as you can see from the uniform as well. I work in gynae oncology, so with ladies with gynecological cancers. Um, and I've been involved with Mummy Star now as one of their mums for 
course six and a half years I think it is now um, so I was diagnosed with um, locally advanced inoperable cervical cancer in December 2016 at the time my daughter was three and a half years old and my little boy was just coming up to 12 weeks old so very very little baby at the time when I was diagnosed now as Pete mentioned in the previous slide, my symptoms had actually started during my pregnancy. So around five months into my pregnancy, I'd started um, presenting with some pelvic um, vaginal bleeding um, to start with. Obviously went to the hospital, had ultrasounds, baby was fine. So there wasn't too many concerns about it, had examinations and no one was particularly concerned because placenta was fine and baby was fine. So it was just kind of seemed to be one of those things that happens in pregnancy. It can happen. Don't worry about it. So as time went on, um, the bleeding got worse. I started to develop bowel and bladder issues, pelvic pain, leg pain, back pain. Um, and again, it was just felt that all of the symptoms were down to pregnancy. Obviously, you know, bowel issues, bladder issues, pain is all quite common in pregnancy and bleeding can happen for non-malignant reasons as well. So it was always put down to the fact that it was just pregnancy related. Even when I had my little boy by emergency C-section because of the bleeding, but also because he was a breech presentation. So luckily he was very clever and he was upside down. Um, and so I had to have a C-section, um, which was brilliant because actually if I'd gone through a natural birth, it would have probably ended up very differently. Um, so even then they still didn't it wasn't what they were looking for. So nothing was noticed. It was only um, a very supportive GP when I was around. I think I was about 10 weeks postpartum. I'd been presenting back to the health visitors, complaining that the bleeding was still happening, the pain was getting worse. I remember trying to, you know, have my little boy at night when he'd woken up crying and just kind of rocking back and forth with him, thinking, oh my God, my pelvis felt like it was going to just snap. The pain was something that, you know, considering I had my first daughter naturally with only a bit of gas and air, I'd not had much pain like that before. Um, and actually the GP was really good. When I went back to the GP, they immediately referred me to the acute hospital as they felt it was potentially an infection still related to the C-section that I'd had or possibly um, you can have things like retained placenta that where bits of the placenta gets left behind and that can cause bleeding and problems as well. So they were still not thinking actually this could be a cancer. They were still thinking this was pregnancy related. Um, and it was only when I eventually had the ultrasound and the examination by the gynaecology team at the hospital um, that suddenly things changed and suddenly they were thinking, right, this could be a cancer. Um, so I was referred for further investigations, ended up being admitted um, as an emergency and ended up having MRIs and CT scans. Um, at that point, my little boy was 11 weeks old and I was breastfeeding at the time, which I'd really wanted to do. So I'd struggled with my daughter to breastfeed. So the fact that me and my son seemed to get on really well with it was fantastic and really positive. But obviously being admitted as an emergency. Very unwell, pain was through the roof, lots of bleeding. Um, so I had to leave my little boy with my husband um, and he was kind of forced to then go on to being bottle fed or syringe fed as he was to start with because I you know it was very different for him to have to be moved across um, and quite traumatic I think probably for me more than my little boy he didn't really care as long as he had food but for me having to to stop that kind of experience and stop being able to feed him as I wanted to um, so what I got my diagnosis um, just after I'd had that admission and then very quickly, everything kind of spiraled into further investigations, further scans um, and then treatment planning, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, internal radiotherapy. So it all everything spiraled so quickly and life became far more about treatment and appointments and everything else than it was supposed to be enjoying my maternity leave with my newborn baby and my little girl. Um, I was very lucky that I had a very supportive family um, and amazing friends as well who could kind of step in and help out. But actually, you know, I couldn't do anything. So on the chemotherapy, I was so exhausted, had lots of nausea and vomiting. Um, so I was pretty much in bed for most of the time. So kind of had that guilt then that I couldn't help with kind of looking after the baby or doing things with my little girl and stuff. So it was quite an overwhelming, all-encompassing time. And that's where Mummy Star came in. 
and that was fantastic I was just thinking I can't actually remember how I found out about Mummy Star in the first place I was trying to think how I found out about you and I think I think it was just Google searching for support and information about cancer and pregnancy or cancer and babies and things um and then I remember getting in touch um with Pete I think it was through Mummy Star um and asking if I could um join the forum and kind of get support from other mums who've been through similar things as well and it kind of um positively spiraled from them um and actually that the online support that's available through Mummy Star and the only of its kind, you know, there's lots of other support groups out there for people with site specific cancers like cervical cancer or, you know, melanoma or breast cancer, but actually it's very difficult to share your experiences as a new mum in those forums because a lot of the ladies in those forums are maybe older or maybe aren't able to have children and and then that that big makes you feel quite um uncomfortable sharing because you don't want to upset other people so being able to have a forum of people who are in similar situations and who who get it you know they can empathize honestly with you and you don't need to hold back you can be very honest with them even if it's three o'clock in the morning being able to reach out and just you know vent or share what's going on for you and being able to do that for other people as well has been fantastic support really really positive um and we're still you know we're still involved in the forum now we're still very you know active and um sad when we see new people join but really nice as well it's kind of the the nicest club that nobody ever wants to be involved with um and also it's not just the cancer diagnosis i think but but also what pete was mentioning about i was 30 five at the time um and so being thrown into a very early menopause and a very sudden menopause as well so going from being non-menopausal to being in the midst of it the symptoms are far more severe when you're put into a very quick menopause than a natural one um and i do remember going to my gp and <laughs> and demanding hrt as luckily i was able to have it as you know cervical cancer isn't um uh, hormonal cancer generally um i remember demanding hrt the the headaches and the mood swings it was just horrific and having a massive impact on my family as well so all of that more guilt then that you're being really mean to your family by being really grumpy and really moody and even more so than normal with you know two young children um had a massive impact and the fact knowing that the treatment that I'd had meant then that, you know, we couldn't have any further children in the future. Um, although I was, you know, very, very happy with the two that I have. And in hindsight, two was probably enough. Um, it, I think it was just knowing that that choice was taken away from you is very different. And again, having that support from other ladies who've been through it was just, yeah, really, really positive. Um, and knowing that, you know, all of the people from Mummy Star um, are there and available for, for support and, and somebody to talk to and get some advice and guidance from as well has been really brilliant. So much so that in my professional role, we've um, made sure that we've got Mummy Star in doing educational um, sessions for us to educate our midwives, our nurses, our doctors, um, to make sure that they're more aware of the support that's available so that when they do come across somebody in this situation, that they know that there is support and for those individuals, but also from a knowledge point of view that they have more confidence when dealing with people that they know that there are more choices and options out there and there are resources that they can go to for support. And we had fantastic feedback after the Mummy Star webinar that we had. Um, how long ago was that now? Yeah, last, uh, last, ja last January we did it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's really, really positive um, feedback after that and quite like to do another one. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a very, very short version of my story. Still living, you know, cancer free. Luckily, I've got no evidence of disease now. Six and a half years later, I had a recent um, MRI scar and after a bit of a scare, but um, all fine and just living now with the side effects of treatment, which, you know, are a whole other thing of their own to live with and, and adds into that mum guilt that you get anyway. But um, yeah, again, without support from resources like Mummy Star, it would make life far more difficult um, than it is at the moment. Thank you, Ria. That's that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to link link into a, a lot of the, the points that um, Ria's sort of talked about now in terms of Mummy Star, but just a little bit more detail. Um, I think the top of it is is that that peer support and that forum based support that you know that has been provided over the years. The, the key thing with this, and, and I guess the, paraphrasing the, the 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 words that many of our families use, is it's created this this mummy star family, and it's it's uh, as Ria you know touched upon. It's not the connection that 
we're able to facilitate for our families through that, that forum support is not based on the specific cancer you have. It, it's not about whether you have breast or cervical or thyroid or, or bowel cancer. It's about the fact that there is that shared um, guilt, I think is, is probably the best word to, you know, to, to use that you just have, is that shared sort of what are we missing out on? What are we not able to do? And how, how people internalize those feelings of that it's it's them almost choosing to not be able to participate when in the, when the reality and what needs validating really desperately quickly for families in this situation is actually this is not your fault. This is not in your control. And this is unfolding in a way that you're not yet going to be able to fully foresee it. And there are going to be many different chunks to this over over the period of of treatment, surgery and you know, and and the longer term aspect as well in that period where it's living with cancer, whether it's, you know, with evidence of cancer still or being cancer free, but the long term impact of it. So by being, able to, by being able to provide that emotional support, it provides that validation for people that they are seen and that they are heard and that this this is something that when you when you think, um, I think that the menopause symptoms is a, is, a, is a good example of this is when you think, oh, you know, that, you know, why am I feeling like this? Or I must be, you know, I'm, I must be causing, you know, issues to other people or how does this knock on to family dynamics? When you then share that with other people and you hear those same things reflected back at you, it does create this. It it does take away some of that isolation, not in its entirety. That's not in our gift to you know to do that. Sadly, but it does. It gives you that that almost that validation that you know what this is not again of something that I it, it you know that is is down to me. This is a, a side effect of what I'm going through on it. You know what I've been through and what I'm what I'm going through on an ongoing basis as well. So, been able to share that. Been able to share it at at, at all hours with anybody. But also being able to be there for other people that suddenly then find themselves in that situation. So, you know, we often find some of the biggest support to new families that get in touch with us. And then we, you know, that we facilitate their introduction to the forum is from those other families that have already been supported or who who know the what the process may look like for that person as it unfolds, where the various trip hazards are. But one of the simplest things I think I can ever illustrate in terms of the impact of what we do is the simplicity of simply saying to somebody, congratulations on the birth of your baby, congratulations on your on the news of your pregnancy, because when everybody else is surrounding that person and is so focused on the fact that they have been diagnosed with cancer, either pre or postnatally, people get consumed by the news of that and they can very, very quickly forget actually where you are, where your focus is, is the fact that you are carrying that much wanted baby or you've just had that baby. So bringing it back to the fact that we are all parents, we are here collectively because our common theme is we are all parents or new parents or we are parents that are grieving the loss of that baby, as opposed to becoming defined by the fact that you have all been diagnosed with cancer. Yes, that is a connector, but it's not the primary status of everybody you know who is on that forum and that is it's a really undervalued um but vital part of you know of, of cancer support and, and it's one of the things that really goes unseen but you know many oncologists that we've been supported by ourselves over the years have said that is arguably far more impactful if that isolation is, goes unchecked than the impact of treatment and surgery on people because that has starts and finishes emotional impact doesn't and therefore it needs that ongoing and as i said at the beginning that timeless support to be offered to people um, so we've been able to provide that and facilitate that for, you know, for, for you know, oh, nearly 1600 families over the last 10 years. And with that goes that family support and advice. It's been able to facilitate when people, you know, when people get their diagnosis and they are directed in so many different directions to be able to seek the support that they have. Ours is one of the is a role of facilitation and been able to pick through all that when people have no headspace whatsoever, having just had that diagnosis is to be able to draw out those pieces of support that are going to be most important to those families. What is really going to make a difference to you when you have a two month old baby at home? You know, and um, you know, what other family support is out there? What, you know, what, what financial advice and support and people, you know, supporting people around their entitlements, um, you know, looking longer term, looking at rewards and, and ways of breaking up the monotony of treatment and the impact of that with, you know, it could be like respite trips away for families and, and working with other organisations. So it's it's very much us is one of, you know, it's a model of collaboration at Mummy Star as well and working with the other small organisations that are out there. Um, advocacy is a, is a, a huge part of what we do. It, it goes back to what I said in an earlier slide about informed choice. There's so many families that don't feel like they are being given the full range of options that they should have in pregnancy um, because people are unfamiliar with the options that somebody can have. So that parent who is desperately wanting a home birth because, I don't know, they weren't able to have it with their first pregnancy and they were determined that it was going to happen this time, only to be told, well, you've got cancer, so you're going to have to deliver that baby in the hospital 
it simply factually is not true. And unless there are clinical reasons as to why birthing at home for that person is, is unsafe, there's no reason why that birth choice shouldn't be fully supported. But it's about working with both the health professionals and the family to ensure that all the options and choices are there and are discussed. And then a plan is, you know, is, is created, you know, including everybody. Um, one of the one of you know, I suppose the the, the start of our, our program around around education comes, I guess, first of all, in looking what what the issues are that are most pertinent to our family. So it could be treatment, it could be financial difficulties, it could, it could be menopausal issues, it could be sex and intimacy, it could be pain management. We've we've created a, a range of resources around all these subjects because our families are talking about them commonly. Our response has been to create resources that people can then tap into. So the next family they get in touch with us that start talking about that issue, we can then direct them to something that we've created. And that could be working with, you know, a family that that ha has a, an insight in, in that area professionally and, pers and personally like Rhea for example um, helped create one of these around um, pain management um, a couple of years ago it could be more recently where we've done ones on sex and intimacy financial um, aid grieving whilst living that topic I discussed earlier on um, menopause is again a common theme that's coming up just so that we've got resources that we can direct both professionals and families that we support into as well um, and obviously wrapped into all of that is trying to help people and support them through the varying pitfalls financially as they, you know, as they come through. And people are just unaware of, you know, what their entitlements are in a situation like this. Something as simple as am I on sick leave or am I on maternity? leave does one thing override the other and then what gets wrapped into that is you know the longer term impact of returning to work how we support families back into work getting you know letting them understand helping them understand their rights and entitlements to phased return again it's one of the real unseen stressors for so many families in this kind of situation and that is our role is to be able to help step through that around advocacy again and making sure that either you know both that we're as aware as you know and as up to date as possible on their rights and and you know the things they need to be aware of as well as being there and supporting that family and making those suggestions and giving that advice because for every family that we support we're then able to learn from that family as well. And we're almost in a pay it forward kind of manner. We're able to then use that learning that we gain to be able to then support another family in the future and another family and almost create this patchwork of support that we can provide and, and overlay, um, you know, with the different situ situations that we see unfold for us. Um, the education and awareness aspect of what we do has become really, really significant. It, uh, when we started out 10 years ago, we didn't see ourselves as an educator. We didn't see ourselves as an organisation who was necessarily going to play the role that we now do. Um, but in the last four to five years, the the call for and the desire for both universities and students, but also existing health professionals to want to hear from us about all the anecdotal evidence we have at when we start of supporting all these families and how these different situations change and how they unfold for families families to be able to help unpick many of the myths and options and choices the family should have. It's become a really integral part of a lot of um, professional learning. And as a result of this, you know, we do now have both both many universities calling for this to become you know, more commonly included within their, their own curriculum. But also, you know, the example that Rhea gave is, is trusts coming to us, midwifery teams, oncology and obs and gynae teams coming to us and asking us to, to come in and either virtually or face to face deliver them a session, which gives them that insight both in what these situations are like for families, matching it with real life scenarios so that they can see the illustration better as to what this looked like in reality for a family. And, and that's highlighting both really positive practice but also where the, where the support that, that family received could have been you know much improved or where families didn't necessarily feel they were communicated with and, and put at the center of, of their um you know of their care planning um and likewise bereavement support is is constantly unfolding you know every family that get in touch with us if we do sadly lose any of our families we are there as much as we reasonably can be to try and support the surviving partner as long as possible if they have been in touch with us already at the point where um you know where their where their loved one was in touch with us seeking support and all of this you know everything that i've just spoken about there it's it's all created this you know this conversation that was needed and needed for a long time to be discussed around cancer and pregnancy it is something that does happen to families there is no getting away from that and we need to talk about it more often get more professionals of multi-disciplines having that conversation so that they all understand why they all play such a key joint and individual role in the support that we build around families in this kind of situation um, that's just a, a recent quote, actually, that just from this week, just from, a, you know, from a family that was supported only a year ago. Um, 
But I think what it illustrates really powerfully is the simplicity of having somebody that you feel has got your back and somebody that is remembering that you are going through this outside of your own unit, outside of your family and your friendship groups or your work colleagues. And, you know, we we don't support families as a statistic, you know, as a as, a, as an initial at, at, at when we start every one of these families. It's very, very personalized support. It's tailored to their individual circumstances. We don't we don't, you know, greet families and say this is what we offer at Mummy Star and how do you fit in? It's about getting to know each family, understanding their own dynamics, their treatment plan, their support structure. And we weave into that how is best that how you know how best we can support that family rather than it being a one size fits all um situation and you know having somebody remember that you're there that you've got a scan coming up that you've got an appointment that week that you could be anxious about is really really key and it really helps disarm um you know people are you know in terms of some of the anxiety that they can feel in the build up to those appointments um we talk about scan anxiety quite a lot it's something that people feel when they're building up to you know 3 6 month scans and it has a really detrimental impact on people but something as simple as that email landing saying we know you've got that scan in 2 days we hope you're doing okay but if you want to call beforehand if you want to chat please just remember we're here um so I suppose the best way of summarising that is just to, to you know to to put some figures on this in terms of how your support is helping us and it say helped us but it is helping us still and this is you know what we've managed to achieve is you know supporting you know, you know over sixteen hundred families in in you know over the last ten years um, but that's gone up significantly over the last five years as we've grown and we've almost hit a point where most hospitals now they're referring pay, pay, you know families to us within a few days of their, them receiving their diagnosis whereas in the first four or five years of the charity because our the impact the information wasn't necessarily out there it could take many many months for somebody to be informed of us we now literally hear from somebody within days you know a maximum i'd say a week of being diagnosed and that is in part to do with a all the awareness work we've done over the years the annual awareness week that we we run around cancer and pregnancy that you know what we've shared in terms of the support and the impact that this has on families but also it's the education and training and how that and that work is is filtering through both to this the existing health professionals that are out there but also to this to entire new generations and cohorts of health professionals that are coming into the industry that are already pre-armed with the information that we can offer not just to the family but it's to them as a professional as well because it's recognizing that this is a deeply traumatic situation for a health professional to watch any family go through so it's making sure that we're, we're creating that almost softer landing you know for people um but the reality is you know, in terms of the support you know the, the support that we're able to offer families there's 70 hours a week of support being able to you know be able to provide it to the families that we're supporting now and that's not just the family that gets in touch tomorrow or emailed us this morning that's those families that have been in touch with us for several years as well that are perhaps long past treatment but they're going through all those ups and downs of what post cancer life looks like and what that new normal normality looks like so that support you know it comes in you know when we look at all the communications that we've had with you know with families over the years whether it's an email, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a text message, whether it's a, you know, sending somebody a voice note on WhatsApp because they can't particularly see that well because of one example we've got with somebody that's got ocular melanoma, you know, we, we you know, communicating with the way that person wants to be communicated with to make sure that our support remains as accessible as possible to every family at any stage during their diagnosis and post that as well. Um, the significant aspect of the education I touched upon it just briefly before is that more and more universities now, rather than us being invited in to maybe deliver a session every now and again, more and more universities are now actually building us into their core midwifery curriculums, particularly so that we're there on a cyclical basis. So we get to teach every single new cohort, whether that's 30 midwives in a cohort or 120, as it was with one university that I, that I visited last week. So that is literally thousands potentially, you know, of, of, mid, of new midwives, of new obs and gynae trainees coming through um, their university curriculum now pre you know like I said pre pre aware that this is something they will see unfold um, at some point within their career so that they know that they can offer people far more choice than they perhaps did you know thought so or otherwise but they also know there's a reference point back for them and their families in the future um, and just in the last three years as you can see you know we've we've, we've delivered this to you know to nearly th nearly 5,000 students and health professionals and those numbers are only going up um, that says a lot to us it says it, it it gives us a lot of validity that what we we are delivering we know is is a you know is a real time message 
that's key for the learning of existing health professionals and then what we have been doing for the last 10 years is clearly sit having an impact people would not continue to refer to us and refer their patients to us unless there was a clear bond of trust and reputational um you know re reputational trust in what we do and knowing that when they refer that person to us they know they're going to be looked after and cared for and treated as an individual and that's going to be there on an ongoing basis and it won't have a you know it won't have a cut off point of two years for example you know where we have to see supporting they, they refer to us speedily because they know we'll look after each one of these families and we'll continue to do so and this really sums up the ethos with us at Mummy Star. It is very much about the identity of the person. And it's, you know, where we get to a situation where we care and listen for, to families and we provide informed choice, we end up in a situation where, you know, where a pregnant person or somebody postnatal with cancer, they are seen as exactly that first and foremost. They're not seen as a cancer patient who happens to be pregnant or a new mum who happens to be, who happens to have cancer. It's, it's very much making sure that their status is not defined by the illness that they have been diagnosed with. And that makes a massive difference to families in terms of both how they feel, but when that viewpoint is used in terms of how we shape the care they receive, whether you're a midwife, whether you're an obstetrician, oncologist, um, you know, health visitor, it doesn't matter what what point you come at this scenario. It's about seeing that person for how they feel and how they felt when they came into that situation prior to their diagnosis, um, because that's how they want to be treated. That's how they want to be seen. Nobody wants to be defined as, you know, a cancer patient. Um, they want to be seen as, you know, who you are and make sure that you, re you retain that identity in the eyes of everybody that can come into your your sphere at that point. So I'm going to finish there and um, I hope that I've been able to give you a, a really good overview and with with Ria's help, thankfully, um, to illustrate the impact of, of, you know, what we have done at Mummy Star, what we continue to do and, and most of all, what we strive to to continue and grow as we're as we're about to step into this this next decade of of support and I'm still kind of pinch myself whenever every, every time I say that but it is you know it's a whole decade of this work behind us now and we've we've made a, a real time you know and we are making a real time difference to you know to many many families out there um so thank you very much for listening and thank you you know above all for your support and and becoming you know part of this and becoming a a, a key you know, foundation and has been able to build this and continue to expand and grow and learn, you know, from each family. Um, so really happy to take any questions that you've you've got. Um, you know, if there's anything that you'd like me to expand on or um, sort of let you know a little bit more in terms of the detail. Um, so, yeah, please feel free. But thanks very much. Thank you. I, I would like to say thank you, Ria, for um, sharing that, your story really um you know i'm so glad that you you're fine now but a very powerful dorian really well articulated well, I, I was going to ask though um you know since you've been doing um the educational stuff with um the midwives and in universities i don't well i don't know if you've been able to do this but have you seen more people being diagnosed earlier because you know what you what you were saying, Maria, was that it was your symptoms, and it seems like a lot of women's symptoms aren't recognised as uh, cancer, but just put down to well, you're pregnant, so every you know just expect all of these awful things, um, you know, as symptoms of your pregnancy. Do you, do you feel that the professionals are now looking out more for earlier signs of um, of the cancers, and not just putting it down to um, symptoms of pregnancy? I think there's there is that real time consideration now. I think when people do, when, oh, I, I think what we, we've I suppose we've come at this from a different side, which is what the first point is is making making those different disciplines aware that they can actually play a role in in the actual start of a diagnosis pathway. So for the midwife, where they traditionally see themselves as mid midwifery and maternity, and not necessarily having any involvement <laughs> potentially in something like oncology. Is, is instilling a confidence in them that if they are supporting a family or they see somebody at booking and they mention a symptom that they would otherwise think, right, you know what, go to your GP and go and get that checked out. 
trying to instill a, a, a you know a, a role in them that actually they can be the referrer they can be the person that puts the referral through to the breast clinic or the gynae clinic or gastro and say do you know what don't delay that potential diagnosis you make the referral today yes it might create some short-term anxiety for that family but it's better to do that and then hopefully either seek reassurance with an, with a scan or if it does become if it does become a diagnosis at least then that 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 you know yeah. that process starts earlier um does it, it are we starting to see diagnosis starting earlier it's it's a difficult one as to whether we'll ever, mm. ever be able to pin it down that they they referred that family because they heard of mummy star i think what we can do is we're starting to certainly see the referrals come through far quicker and as soon as a midwife knows that somebody is diagnosed they are onto us straight away um either themselves or the family themselves have been told by the midwife and they come home and then they they look us up or they google us like like you know like ria um explained in her situation and then they get in touch with us straight away themselves so that because there's that multitude of ways that you can get in touch with us that certainly shortens um shortens that um in terms of whether that diagnosis is speeding up i think given the given the speed at which we're we're seeing people while we can't categorically say it's happening because of us i think because there is that wider consideration and conversation out there now around around cancer and pregnancy there's that wider awareness that it potentially could be something that's need, need needs to be considered and that's mm -hmm. notwithstanding the fact that there are difficulties in you know the use of some some diagnostic tools for certain cancers in pregnancy obviously you can't do some of the more more intrusive um diagnostic checks for some cancers than you can for others you can't scan people beyond a you know adequately you know beyond a certain gestation of pregnancy but is it speeding up and is it changing is it changing the consideration of whether those symptoms could be something more serious i absolutely feel that it is um and the fact that the, the the manner in which we receive referrals now is certainly painting that picture to us that's what's happening in real time Just um, thanks, Lois. Hi, and um, thank you so much. It's been uh, really interesting hearing um, about all the amazing work you've done over the last ten years, and also um, uh, real your personal experiences. So thanks so much. It's uh, really shocking to hear the statistics and also the lack of support that's out there more broadly. So. And um, you're clearly doing amazing work. And um, I was just wondering, um, what obviously this is ten years, a big milestone. But kind of what's next? Like, what would you like to see realised longer term by a non star? And how can supportive and donors help you get there? I think some of it is, is is probably going back to the question that Amanda's just just asked: is for us to be able to pinpoint how tangible that impact is in terms of all that learning that we're you know that we're instilling in people and how we're passing on the learning that we gain with every family to turn it into a real time figure as to you know are people being listened to are diagnosis happening quicker because they're being considered um i think because i think sometimes with cancer we get and I don't, I don't I'm interested to hear your feelings on this, Ria. I think sometimes we can get we can get hung up on a fear factor of when we hear diagnosis rates going up, we immediately respond to that with an, with a negative response. But there is an element within that that needs to be seen as if the diagnosis is happening in the first place, that in itself is a good thing because it means somebody is being listened to. It means somebody did do that referral in a hopefully timely manner. Um, and yes, if we see if we see the diagnosis of cancer and pregnancy go up over the next over the next, say, 10 years, for example, does that mean that people are being taken seriously and therefore they're being listened to more quickly? And those symptoms are actually being fast forwarded and fast tracked. And the I think the the um, you know the kind of safety netting process that has been instilled in some trusts around the around the country. One of our other um, families who's a GP has been working on this in um, in Suffolk around a, like a like a rap forget the, the title of it like a rapid response kind of um referral system around um around some cancer symptoms so they're seen as red flags in independence on their own rather than being explained away for many many months at a time um so ultimately yeah we would want to be able to look and see actually this has changed and people are being diagnosed far earlier and far quicker and i feel like they're being listened to because that professional heard about us once or they heard about us at a conference or they actually had they were um part of the audience at an education session that we delivered once but there's the flip side of it as well which is the the public awareness campaign is are people um we you know we can talk and talk and talk about the importance of health professionals listening to families being you know being diagnosed when they present with symptoms but there is an equally important public health awareness message in this which is be your own health advocate what you know one of the things that i talked to students about quite quite a lot is that 
just because we have all these body awareness messages out there, like we have copper feel and we have our, you know, feel at first on the on the first of the month messages and, and you know, and bowel cancer symptoms and, you know, the messages around check your poo and bleeding. But the question we always come back to is as soon as you become pregnant, do you then start to those messages fall out of the awareness of that person? Do you still check your breasts regularly when you're pregnant as you do when you're not pregnant? And I still think there's a there's a there's a gap there in terms of that that awareness drops. And I think we need to make sure that those messages are done in tandem with pregnancy. Um, instilling a culture in mid in midwives and health visitors as one of the first things that they do when they go and visit somebody postpartum is to say, were you due a smear during your pregnancy? If so, can I book it for you now so that it doesn't get delayed? Because these are some of the things that simple as they may seem at the offset, they can be so key, but they can be so easily forgotten during pregnancy or post. I mean, you know, we, many of us are parents. We know how how full our heads are, uh, you know, whether we've birthed or we're, you know, we're a non-birthing parent. We know how quickly things like that can be forgotten, but it's it's about, it becomes a key component of, you know, cancer awareness in and around pregnancy to say, get those checks done, were they due? And it becoming a core component of uh, postnatal care would be, you know, would be really, really positive. And that hopefully then would, would either shorten the length of time it takes to get that referral and those checks done, or we'd be able to say and track it back and say, actually, that referral process started because that midwife thought that person had, was, had something suspicious. But it's also placing the placing the ability and the confidence in those professionals to say, you know what, I'm not happy about what I'm seeing in this in, in this 34 year old woman. I'm not happy about the way that that breast tissue feels when she's asked me to examine it. Why is it? You know, why has she got a protrusion on her chest bone? Um, and, you know, and seeing that and say, Do you know what, that can be tracked back to the midwife picked that up and said, I'm going to refer this because I'm not happy and seeing it as part of their core role. Um, but, you know, we, we refer back to midwifery quite commonly, but I think it's because we've been we've heard it so many times from midwives where they've said, I'm just a midwife. What can I do? And we, we were at pains to really break that down and say to midwives and students, you are not just anything. You will never just be a midwife. You're as, you're as important as an obstetric consultant, as is an oncologist, as is a health visitor, because you can all have an equal role to play in that person's um, route to diagnosis or otherwise. Um, and it, it helps break down this, I guess, this red herring that you, you hear this phrase sometimes from people where you say, well, you're, you know, you're, you're prodded and poked more times in pregnancy than any other time in your life. How can cancer symptoms possibly be missed? Well, the reality is there, you know, we can see it, we feel it, we hear it on a day to day basis. It clearly doesn't always get considered as the first port of call. Otherwise, people wouldn't go back and forth to hospitals all the way through pregnancy, only to then subsequently be diagnosed postnatally when they've been diagnosed with mastitis and, you know, blocked milk ducts. And then so subsequently, then they've, they've got a cancer diagnosis that they're suddenly trying to deal with and all the, you know, all the trauma I've described that then unfolds with that. Can I just add something to that, Pete, just um, in mm. response to Lewis? I think the key there for us, really one of our main objectives, is over the next two to three years, we want cancer and pregnancy training to be mandatory. And if it's not mandatory, then at least something that all or the vast majority of universities, hospitals, kind of any kind of healthcare settings provide a certain level of training and that for us would be that's where we're working towards so that it's national there's not a postcode lottery on who your hospital is um, so that it's part of everybody's um, training and education as a healthcare professional across all different types of professions and then I think the other main objective from a, a public perspective is that we currently support and see around 20% of women and families that are diagnosed a year and we want to through public awareness try and bring that up to around 40% in the next two to three years. Um, again a lot of that will come down to healthcare professionals so the, the two things kind of go side by side and we can't focus on one without the other we have to do it um, slowly gaining momentum but that that's ultimately what we're aiming to do in the next two to three years. I think those those are the time frames, aren't they, Pete? Roughly. Yeah, and I think the rep. I think some of that comes back to the reputational impact as well. I think the 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 session that Ria um, talked about last year, where we did it with the with the North Devon Trust, but it also included a lot of other peripheral health professionals that kind of bordered other trusts as well. So I think we had about a hundred and. 110, 115 people, mm -hmm. I think, um, on that call in total. But we've subsequently then been contacted by a number of other trusts to do similar sessions. So I did one in Buckinghamshire um, not so long ago. I think there was over 300 
um, members of staff on that call, but there was there was multi, every, I had everybody on that from senior oncologists to mid, midwives to obs and gynae trainees to health visitors, the whole realm of people that can possibly have any input on somebody in pregnancy or postnatally was on that call. And the feedback again is just that that eye opening, you know, even when you're hearing consultants saying I've been in practice 20 years and I never knew or had any idea of the real time impact that this has on families. And he wasn't talking of that situation. He wasn't talking about the, the, the treatment related impact. He was talking about all that unseen impact that we talk about, you know, both in the short and long term for families as well. So there is that reputation, you know, like I said, originally it was us reaching out, you know, in a large part to try and, you know, deliver some of this education to people. We're now being contacted by as many people who want it as we are contacting people to say this is what we offer. And so there, there's going to be a point, thankfully, I think, with the way this is going, with the, with the trend we're seeing at the moment, where those two things are just going to merge into one and we will have this total mapping. And that's, that's you know, that's what we're aiming for, both with universities, but also the trusts to want to have that cyclically, because obviously there's going to be that transient nature of NHS staff as well. Um, you know, but it's, it's also, I suppose, what's intertwined with it all is that, is that support message of you know the NHS and you know and, and encouraging people when they have these symptoms to trust the, their service and support and access their hospitals, um, because I still we are still dealing with some of the post COVID I think mindset of, of I don't want to bother somebody I don't want to take up somebody's time and it's like no it's open go and see somebody go and get checked don't delay, and and I think it's one of the roles that we see ourselves as you know really is is key you know is. is you know, we are we we are supported by so many NHS colleagues and other health professionals, and we you know we need we're reciprocating that as well to make sure that that intervention happens as quickly as possible, however or whatever route that takes. Any anything else that we can answer or expand on, or any any gaps that we've perhaps not covered? That you were um, wondering about, I guess, before you came onto the call, or, or I guess, when you, you know, when you, when you supported us, or, or kind of first heard about the organisation and, and and what we do. And not from me. Um, I actually, I'm going to have to go because I've got another meeting. Um, no worries. Thank you so much for the um, the presentation, and uh, to you, Ria, uh, for your story and just. Brilliant project. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank, thank you for your support. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.